Thanks for listening to the Free For All After Party from Fox 4. The best news, sports, and weather is available anytime at fox4news.com. Now, enjoy the show. All right, this is the third edition of Free For All, the After Party podcast. Mike, how do you feel on this lovely Friday morning of February 11th, 2022. It's, I think it's one of our favorite weekends of the year, Sam, when you do what we do for a living, right? I mean, Super Bowl weekend, it's always, it's always fun. The anticipation uh, continues to build. I, I've covered a lot of Super Bowls in person. And so some of those memories come back, but it's, uh, it's, why would, you know, why would you want to be in Los Angeles soaking all of that in when you can be back here in North Texas covering it from a, from afar so uh we're doing we're doing our best we've got a good week i think on our on our tv show uh, trying to bring home some of the the local angles and there are a ton of them but no i'm doing well i'm doing well how are you we're gonna get uh, we're gonna get into some of your super bowl memories here in a moment um i'm lovely i'm a little tired uh but that's no surprise i'm not a morning person as mike knows i I typically don't go to bed before 2 a.m fun little fact about me Mm. my mom is always like Sam, when you go home, you need to wind down, put your phone down, shut the lights off. I'm like, mom, when you go home, get home from work at like five, do you go right to bed? No, it's the same thing. Do you (laughs) snap? Do you snap back at your mom typically like that? Is that the tone you use with your mother? No, I don't. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, sometimes I'm a little feisty, you know, Uh, but yeah, but here I am. No, I'm happy. But before we get into all this Super Bowl stuff, Mike, we have to talk about our day yesterday, which was way busier than we thought first, starting with the NBA trade deadline. When it comes to the Mavs, Mike, I honestly, I I didn't think they were making any moves yesterday. I had kind of, I hadn't really heard a lot of rumblings that were picking up traction, you know, earlier in the week. But the fact that they traded Chris Stapp's Porzingis, not that I didn't think that maybe it would ever happen because that had been going on, you know, and pretty heavily during the summer, there were thoughts that he might not even be on this team when the season started. But in my mind, he had just started to pick up a little rhythm. I wanted to see him and Luca this time around in the playoffs together, especially with Jason Kidd. He was so unhappy with how they utilized him last year in the playoffs. And now we're never going to get to see it. So that duo, that partnership, very short lived. The more I think about it, the more I hear about it, the more I read about it. I think so much of this had to do with dumping that contract and and the fact that here's a guy that had just missed so many games due to injury. And I think they finally came to the conclusion that this this was just never going to be a player who could stay on the court enough to justify, begin to justify what you're paying him. And even though the chemistry seemed better with Luca this year, with Jason Kidd, and his staff doing a better job than Carlisle did in terms of making that work. They, they just never seemed totally comfortable together. And this is Luca's team, I mean, obviously, without a doubt. And this move wouldn't have happened unless Luca was comfortable with it. I'm not saying they necessarily went to him and asked him about it, but they knew how, how Luca felt about it before it happened, I, I, I have a feeling. Yeah, it was it was a surprise, but th- these tend to happen on trade deadline day. You've covered the NBA for a long yeah. time in Oklahoma City before you came here, and um, it, it it's you know we we started to hear that maybe Dragic would end up here, going to San Antonio, then they're buying him out. That still might happen, and I thought, oh, that'd be a nice little acquisition. And then boom, the the KP thing happened. So I don't know how much it really changes for their team this year, to be honest. I mean, they're going to be a playoff team. It's going to be a struggle to win a first round playoff game or a series. It would have been with KP or now without him. And I don't know how much these guys are acquiring can help right away either. But I think they think that it makes them better long-term in terms of giving them some flexibility. And Harrison, the GM said that some flexibility to make other moves because of what they won't have to be paying Porzingis now. Yeah, it was funny. Luca was quoted as saying last night that he likes to be involved a little bit in terms of what they're doing with the trades, but that he was shocked that KP was traded and he said he was still sleepy when he heard news, which I found <laughs> kind of funny that he was quoted as saying that. But yeah, I think this screams ultimately 
you know, you want to keep Luca here because here's the thing. Everything's great now. You know, he had an amazing performance last night. One of the best that we've seen arguably in his career, a new career high 51 points dropped 28 in the first quarter, hit seven threes, but ultimately you better keep Luca happy because if you don't, he will leave. We've seen that in the NBA now. It's it's not like it was years ago. Guys will join super teams. Guys will demand trades if they're unhappy. I mean, just look at what happened with James Harden now going to Philadelphia. I mean, he's been all over the place so much for that experiment in Brooklyn with Katie and Kyrie Irving. So Yes, I think ultimately it's about that. Like you said, Spencer Dinwiddie, David, Davis Bertans. Um, you know, it's not the splash necessarily that I thought that they would make. But, you know, in terms of Luca, you put shooters around him. I know both of those guys are kind of having off years right now. We'll see what happens. And then in terms of the offseason, those contracts, Mike, are more movable. Because another guy you're going to want to keep around is Jalen Brunson, who everyone keeps talking about, who is going um, – He's going to get paid a lot of money, and teams are, are going to want him. He is a starter. He's proven himself. So it, it'll be interesting. But, yeah, it was um, a way busier night than we thought. And uh, pivoting over to the Cowboys for just a second, if we can, NFL awards last night, Mike. You know, I think it's so funny because during the week ESPN, and you made a comment about this too, that they did a three-part series of what's gone wrong with this franchise during Super Bowl week. I mean, does that not scream of just the Cowboys brand and how they managed to stay in the conversation? Yeah. <laughs> well, we said this on TV last night, and it's funny how our night changed because, you know, just to pull back the curtain a little bit, it's not that complicated of a process the way our TV show goes together. But <laughs> early in the day, we thought, well, DeMarcus Ware is probably going to get into the Hall of Fame. That's a lead story. You know, a guy, a cowboy goes into the hall and then off of that, somebody from the Cowboys is going to win an, a, an award or two. You know, Dak's probably going to win comeback player of the year. And then we'll get to the trade because that's been around for a while now. And then the Mavs game. Well, suddenly nothing really goes right for the Cowboys of the awards. Parsons, as we all knew, won defensive rookie of the year. But Burrow over Dak for comeback player of the year, which I, which I don't like. That was the Burrow mania, I realize, is running rampant now. You but think I'm Dak sorry. should have gotten it? As I tweeted, if, you're, if your foot is pointing in the wrong direction one, one day, <laughs> and, and then a few months later you're back playing football and throwing 37 touchdowns and 10 interceptions on the, the top-ranked offense in the league, I'm sorry, you're the comeback player of the year. I know Joe Burrow Burrow had tore, a, he tore I know. and MC. He did, and that's a nice little story and a nice little injury. And then he came back and bought him in the Super Bowl. But I got to stay with Dak on, on this one. But anywho, none of the awards came through for the Cowboys, where, again, I think got screwed in not getting into the Hall of Fame. Like coming off like a Cowboy homer here, but this whole no. business of the first ballot and guys having to wait and all this crap, I guess. Okay, whatever. He'll get in next year. Mike took Michael Irvin three years to get in. So I guess it's not that unusual for where to have to wait. But anyway, at the last minute, we decided since none of this came through, well, it's a perfect night to lead basketball. So we talked about the trade and then did the game because Luca had 51 points and everything. But it was it was kind of one of those fun nights to do to do what we do. And, and the, the great... Uh, the great Mark Jones was helping us out, getting some stuff together at the last minute. So uh, we got it all in the air. Yeah, we, I, we is like, my audio crackling again? I'm sorry. Just a little bit. There you go. Just It's just hitting that right keep, there. Keep it away from the collar. Yeah, yeah. Is that the key? Yep. All right. Is it do it when I do, does it do it when I do this or is it just the collar? No, it's just collar. But yeah, try not to do that too much either. <laughs> is it ruffling against? Okay. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> <laughs> podcast things um yeah it turned out to be a really really busy night in sports but we like that around here uh, you know what i didn't realize about this uh super bowl mike super bowl 56 in la fun little fact both What's quarterbacks that? wear the number nine did you realize that well i i did <laughs> but i'd never really thought about it before right S stafford used to wear seven in high school i heard him talking earlier in the week about how he couldn't wear nine with the Lions when he got into the NFL because some guy in the 30s wore it for the for the Lions. As Stafford said some guy who probably completed 14% of his passes back then. But, uh, yeah, so Matthew had to change to, uh, to number nine. 
Joe Burrow. Is there, more to, this... is there more to that story than just no, the fact that they I both were number nine or is that I it? just okay. didn't realize it. I'm like, oh, they both were number nine. Joe Burrow had a crazy story about throughout his career. He <laughs> changed his number because this number wasn't available because that number wasn't available. Um, yeah, Super Bowl in sunny L.A. You have Matthew Stafford, Joe Burrow, two great quarterbacks. We talked about it on our show last night. On one hand, you have Matthew Stafford, who – after all he went through in Detroit, 12 seasons, finally gets his shot. And now you have Burrow in his second season, who is leading this quote-unquote Cinderella team to the Super Bowl, although they do not consider themselves a Cinderella mm-hmm. by any means. And they've proven themselves when everyone was betting against them throughout these playoffs. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you like about these quarterbacks, Mike? I mean, there's just so many storylines with these teams. Is it, it's nice to me to have some new blood new faces uh, in the Super Bowl. I think that is fun. I I think what I like about Stafford and you and I both talked with members of Matthew Stafford's family this week, I interviewed his sister and you had that great feature with his mom. Uh, And, and they both just talked about his character. And, And I think what I like about Stafford is that he never complained. Not that I heard anyway, during those 12 years in Detroit (laughs) where they put a bad team around him year after year after year. And all of the experts said, man, if only Matthew Stafford had something around him, this guy's an amazing talent. And even I started to wonder, well, maybe it's not just the talent around him. Maybe it's just Stafford as well. But now he gets to L.A. and boom, you know, he had a ton of pressure to deliver right away with the best team money could buy. And he's he's obviously done that. So you respect that about Stafford. I just like I don't know. They carry themselves so differently. I think Stafford just is is sort of a low key guy. And Burrow already is being known for his swag. Aikman was on, I think, Dan Patrick yesterday, and he said that's the one thing he, I don't know if he said envies about him, but really admires about him is is his swag. And uh, Joe Burrow is kind of like a Joe Namath was at at that age, just, you know, wearing the clothes and, and wearing the sunglasses and just having fun with it. And But you have to have the game to back it up, and clearly, clearly he does. So the NFL is about the quarterbacks, ultimately, and if they have personalities and, and if there's some contrast there, that, that makes it all the better. So that's why this game's so much fun, I think. We're going to get to our picks, uh, you know, at the end of the show. But yeah, I agree, I agree with you. Joe Burrow, to me, just he's confident, but he also has this little nerdy factor to him as well on top of the swag. So it, it, it's, it's yeah. kind of a funny dynamic. Yeah, that's why it's, there's some irony to it, right? Because he's <laughs> yeah. almost like this guy that just walked out of the library and, and now he wants to be cool to hang around <laughs> with his other friends. Joe Shiesty. I love all the nicknames he has. Yeah, why you is know, that his nickname? Joe what does that I mean? Shiesty. I, you know, I got to look that up. I honestly don't even know. I think it's it's one of his many. Joe okay. Cool was another one. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I loved it when he won the national championship, how he was in the locker room with the cigar. <laughs> I think that was kind of one of those moments that everyone was like, he's the man. Like, after yeah. That. yeah. But no, it, it was great talking his mom to his mom earlier this week. Um, you know, I always think it's fun talking to the families of these guys because it, it, it's something that they too have dreamed about for such a long time. You know, she's heading out there Saturday morning because she said that she wanted him to have the most normal week possible, that they're Mm going to have a family dinner over his house, which, by the way, there's all these articles, you know, heading into Super Bowl week about Matthew Stafford's home. Go check it out. It's a $20 million home in Los Angeles in the same neighborhood as as Kylie Jenner among (laughs) one name. But it's uh, it's beautiful. It's modern. It's just funny because they always do these kinds of stories um, leading up. But then you have his wife, um, Kelly, Mike, who had that non-cancerous brain tumor three years ago. She's healthy now. They have four beautiful girls. So, you know, it's uh, it, it would be a great story for him if they well, were to win. <laughs> it's funny because we talk about Stafford suffering all those years in Detroit. But as Corby pointed out on our show earlier this week, he was getting paid. So it was, right. you know, he, he's, he was doing, he was doing okay, but it's, I think if he wins Sunday, only Elway would have had to wait longer as a quarterback to win his first Super Bowl. I like think maybe oh, wow. Elway had one more season under his belt before he won than Stafford would have. This would be Stafford's 13th year. And I think it was always 14. So it's pretty unusual to play this long without getting there and then finally, you know, get there and, and win it. So, um, 
a lot of people around here, obviously, that the Highland Park angle, that, that community is has turned out in, in full force to, to support him. And uh, made the our shirts. news reporters, yeah, I've been doing a lot of stories <laughs> this week on on the Stafford shirts. And I, I saw this morning uh, our very own Hannah Batal was out at one of the uh, elementary schools doing uh, live shots on Good Day as they were celebrating their favorite son, Matthew Stafford. So that'll be fun. And you know what's uh, you know what's crazy to me too. So the Rams are hosting the Super Bowl. Tampa Bay did it a year ago, but they're actually the visiting team. The Rams are the visiting team. And the uh-huh. other thing I didn't realize, and maybe I should have realized this, that you know the Super Bowl is its own entity. Obviously, it's a money maker. I think the average ticket price is five grand for the Super Bowl, which is insane. But do you know the players? They have to buy back their suites, like Matthew Stafford mm-hmm. for the Super Bowl. He had to buy back his suite and it wasn't quite a million right under wow. under that. But can you imagine? I guess in my mind, I just thought, well, surely they're hosting the Super Bowl. The quarterback of the Rams and some of these star guys, I guess in my mind, I just thought that they wouldn't have to pay anything. So that was stupid of me to think that. <laughs> yeah, you feel worse for the guys farther down the chain, you know, on these on these rosters who don't make nearly what Stafford makes or, or you know, some of the other. Uh, you know, Aaron Donald or some of those guys, some of the the guys who aren't making that much, what it cost them to try to get in. But yeah, the, the cost is just, just for the fans is, is it's absurd. I was hearing this morning that there are parking spots that cost $4,000. Like if you want to park it's right up next to, the, next to the stadium and you're right, the, the Rams are the visiting team technically yes. because of the NFC, but they will get their own locker room. I read where, is it because their the char- actual locker room? Yeah, because the, the Chargers have a locker room and the Rams have a locker room in that stadium. So the NFL predetermined that the NFC team would get the Rams locker room and the AFC would get the Chargers locker room. And that's they're both so exactly funny. the same with the same amenities. Okay. So that's not that big a deal. But So the Rams will ha- be uh, in familiar surroundings in, in that way. The other funny thing about the stadium is it's covered, but it's not really... Uh, climate controlled per se the sides are open and it's going to be really hot it could be 90 degrees sunday in los angeles so you wonder if that might be a little bit of a factor for these teams on the field jimmy kimmel joked that they might do the gatorade bath before the game instead of after the game 90 degrees yes (laughs) i like that joke it's funny (laughs) (laughs) i could could tell (laughs) he Uh, delivered it much better than i did you've covered a lot of super bowls in your time how many I was counting, I think, 11. I was looking at it the other day. We, we used to go every year whether the Cowboys were in or not, and they're, they're never in. <laughs> so I got here right after they'd won back-to-back in the 90s, and then they, they missed it my first year after the 94 season. The Niners beat them, so we, covered, we, we went to the Super Bowl and covered it anyway. Uh, and then they won it the year after that, after the 95 season in, in Phoenix. But um, so... It, it it was a, f- a cool way to to get to cities that I'd never been to before. Miami, you know, New Orleans covered one in San Diego the year after uh, Switzer got fired, or right after the season after which Switzer got fired. And Jerry was running uh, coaching candidates through the Hotel Del Coronado, this amazing hotel oh my gosh. <laughs> in the San Diego area. So we're camped out in the lobby trying to get these guys as they're walking in and out. George Seifert and Terry Donahue and some of the the hot coaching names at the time, trying to figure out who he was, was going to hire. So we, we covered, I think the last one of the consecutive Super Bowls that I covered was the first Brady uh, victory in a Super Bowl. Oh, I wow. forget exactly okay. what year that was. Then we took a break and we covered uh, obviously the one here during that icy uh, year uh, in 2011. <laughs> and then I covered the one in Houston a few years ago. I've got to interrupt you there. Sorry to cut you off. Well, first, Mike is so funny because when Mike, you know, he re- he relives the glory days a lot. But I, do. I, I try Too to much. tell him that I try to tell him that these days could be the glory days and it's in their own way. You know, I'm here for one. So there's <laughs> I, I start so many stories with and my my girls hear this all the time. I start so many stories with I've probably said this before, but and usually it's true. I have said it before. At least once every day you say that. But you actually have a great story of 
you and our photographer, Chris Hanks, when you guys were covering the Super Bowl here, because it was one of the coldest weeks in Dallas history, if I'm not mistaken, right? And you have a great story about well, that. I don't want to violate HIPAA laws here or oh, anything, but yeah. but we're up we're doing live shots outside uh, Jerry World and they, they usually they, they set up a scaffolding like literally two stories high for all the stations to to stand or sit on so you've got a nice backdrop with the stadium there. And it was cold. I mean the wind chill was probably single digits. It was windy and Chris Hanks our our, our sports photographer was standing up there for a long time. He, he wasn't just shooting my live shot. He was shooting live shots for other Fox stations, for our news reporters. So he was up there, I'm guessing, you know, for, for a couple of hours without being able to come down. And I would just run. <laughs> I'd wait inside and then run up, do the, the two-minute live Diva. shot and come Diva. back down. Exactly. <laughs> Can't so after it. <laughs> we're finished, I'm being a common man like I am, trying, him, trying to help him uh, – carry some of the equipment down from the scaffolding and we're walking to the car and I'm walking and, and I look back and Mr. Hanks is, is on, all, is on all fours back there in the parking lot. He had uh, been overcome by the, the conditions. I mean, it was oh, I really can't even nasty. Imagine. That's awful. It I'm was, not laughing at you, Hanks. If you ever listen, it's really nasty. It's horrible. And so um, there was some sort of hypothermia situation setting in. So I help him up and we get him to his car and start it and, you know, get him warmed up. Well, I had somewhere I had to be. So I was just <laughs> going to kind of send him on his way. And uh, I'm walking to my, <laughs> I'm walking to my car and I, get a, and I get a call from one of our news managers saying, hey, you got to you got to stay with Hanks here and help get him to uh, medical attention. So I'm like, okay, sure. So I go back and, and we get, uh, we get Chris. And I, I don't know if I should divulge the exact medical treatment, but uh, let's just say he, we got yeah. him some more attention that, that helped him, um, that helped him feel better. But that's, that's the kind of situation we're talking about there. And, and the kind of sacrifices I make for my coworkers. I didn't get my dinner that night. Didn't you tell the nurse some joke, how you joked that that was your partner or something? <laughs> <laughs> Mike always trying to add the comic relief in situations. Uh, well. He was okay, correct? He was all right. He oh, yeah, yeah. Warm. Fine. And, you know, he's, he's healthier than all of us put together right now. I mean, for a man his age, he has, uh, oh, uh, yeah. Hanks, know, and, uh, Hanks he's athletic. very robust. Yeah. But it's it's funny because I noticed on the Goodell presser the other day, the commissioner was raving about L.A. and the stadium and how it will host many, many more Super Bowls. And I'm thinking Jerry has to cringe when he hears that because you, you wonder when Arlington's going to get another one. They're so lost in the shuffle right now. As great as that stadium is, that one stroke of bad luck that we I mean, what if it was like it is now during Super Bowl week uh, when it was here? Uh, a decade ago it would have changed the entire uh attitude i think but we got that freak ice event that just stayed cold all oh, all gosh. week it was nasty it was bad so we're gonna take a quick little break we're gonna come back for a, a little shorter second half of this segment we're gonna talk about our favorite super bowl halftime performances mm-hmm. maybe I best national up. anthem okay. all right we'll be back Tim Ryan here. And I'm Lauren Prisbull, here to remind you that good day is here for you tomorrow morning with local news, weather, and traffic. We have a lot of it. Six hours to be exact. What does that mean for you? Traffic hotspots, constantly changing weather conditions, too. So much going on here and all around the world. We'll bring you all of it. No matter when you start your day, live and local, that's good day. 4 to 10 a.m. on Fox 4. See you in the morning. Do, 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 do. 
All right, we are back. This is the Free For All After Party podcast. It is Friday, February 11th. Super Bowl just two days away. Mike, I'm particularly excited because if we have to work on Sunday, at least we're going to get to eat. We're having a potluck at the station. Mike has agreed to spend his um, precious dollars on some Domino's pizza for us. <laughs> I might I might go with another brand. You never know. Just kidding. Wrong with Domino's. Um, no, they're I actually love Domino's, but I'm like a thin crust Domino's oh, okay. girl. So if okay. you can get me a specialty pizza, I would appreciate okay. it since I am your sure. co-host. Uh-huh. Um I'm excited. I'm actually really excited about the Super Bowl halftime show this year. You got Mary J. Blige, you have Kendrick Lamar, you got Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Dr. Dre. And I believe I've hit all of them there. But this is strictly a hip hop show. Um, who performed in the halftime? Lap? Was it The Weeknd? I'm pretty sure it was The Weeknd. I, I think so. I think so. God, I'm so, I'm just looking it up right now because I know we're going to talk about our favorite ones. No, I'm you're gonna good. Have to have you, I'm going to have to have you start because I just, no, I it's forget. fine. The second they're the second they're over, I forget who did the halftime show. No, um, so I'm I'm really excited. I love hip hop. I love rap. I just think, and here's the thing with last year's, I love the weekend. I think he's extraordinarily talented. But to me, when you have a Super Bowl halftime performance, it needs to be the type of thing where it makes you want to get up and dance. It's supposed to ignite the crowd and. I won't say the weekend can't do that, but I, I don't feel like he did that last year because he some of his songs are, are much more mellow and kind of chill vibes. But you got Mary J. Blige, Snoop Dogg, you got Eminem, who I grew up on Eminem, which is gonna be which is hilarious. And I didn't realize the other day that he's fifth or almost if he's 49, if not 50. So it's crazy. But if we're revisiting the halftime shows of the past, the first one that I always, always think about is Michael Jackson's halftime mm-hmm. show in 93. I believe the Cowboys were playing yep. that year. That's right. yeah. um, I just remember him starting the show like really high up. I remember watching it live really high up in the stadium. And then he popped up like out of the stage in the center. And that was when pyrotechnics and all that kind of thing was really big. You know, he was obviously more popular than he had ever been at that point. And it was just groundbreaking on a lot of fronts. But I mean, we talk about, we talked about this the other day, that musical artist wise, who is a name that everyone would know, right. And that you, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have to worry about the generation gaps. Well, I feel like everyone knew who, I mean, I was so young. Everyone knew who Michael Jackson was, and he was so popular at the time. Obviously, after he died, there was all that controversy. Not going to get into any of that. I'm just talking strictly about... No, let's spend a segment on that. (laughs) His his talent as a performer, and I just thought that performance was unbelievable. So that's the one that I always go to. It was a game changer, it seems, as to how that whole halftime thing came together. First Super Bowl I covered, uh, Diana Ross was the halftime. Uh-oh. She was a popular performer in the 60s and 70s, Sam. She had a group called the Supremes <laughs> that did pretty well. Mike acts like and I don't know good. about older music. Um, and I, I understand what you mean about the, the, the show needing to get people up and dancing and all that, but it, it isn't really aimed toward the stadium. It, it's aimed toward the, the massive television audience. So I think there've been some great halftime performances that aren't really dance performances, you know, like uh, I think of U2, for example, and just the great, you know, tight show that they do. And, and uh, to me, it's just, it's just important that it, that it sounds good. Yeah. If it has some, some elements that get the people in the, in the stadium going, that that's. I lost you. Occasionally that you happens. You for, cut out. The, oh, okay. Yeah, all right. You're back. For, You're back. for the most part, it, uh, you know, there, there are some, I'm just rambling now. I don't really have opinions on the halftime <laughs> show, to be honest. I'm just trying to, this is a word salad for me at this point. I'm not saying dance, it, more so energize. I feel like the halftime show should energize you and, and entertain above all else to a very high level. So yes, I think we're going to be entertained. 
Uh, what about best national anthem, Mike? Oh, I, I think it's pretty unanimously thought to be Whitney Houston, right? And, and it, you know, we found out later it was a voice track or whatever. I don't care. I mean, it was just because it was still live. She probably did the voice track in one take. It was so it was so stirring and, and just she was, I think, has maybe the greatest Ugh. female voice of all time. So that was uh, that was really good. I, I have trouble thinking of another one that could possibly compare just as we sit here right now. I can't either. That's I, I mean, I don't know one that tops her. I really don't. You know, yeah. R.I.P. Whitney. I mean, she just had one of the most beautiful voices of all time. Another thing, not really sports related when it comes to the Super Bowl for me is, is always the commercials, you know, back mm-hmm. in its heyday when all of us, you know, it was appointment television. I, I think that those commercials were probably the best. I hope we got, we get some good commercials, you know, this year I was talking to you the other day about it. One of my favorite series of commercials has always been the Budweiser commercials. Cause those have always like tug at my heartstrings. Like there was one in particular with the horses and the yellow lab puppy. And I just lose it when it comes to dogs because I love dogs. Mike is always telling me, Tim, you need to get a dog. You need to get a dog. I would love a dog, but a dog is like a child and I'm alone here. So <laughs> I need help in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I heard they were talking on the ticket this morning about the prop bets for the Super Bowl. One of them is how many dogs, how many commercials will feature dogs? And the over under was like six and a half because got to be the a dog, dog is a device used often in the in Super Bowl commercials. That's for sure. But the bar is so high now in terms of what people will find funny or entertaining or what will really kind of move the needle in terms of these Super Bowl commercials. And I, I meant to look up the uh, exact price for 30 seconds on the Super Bowl right now. But man, these talk about pressure on these ad agencies to to come up with something different and and, uh, and memorable. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Look it up I, right I just, now. Yeah, look it up because I'm curious too. Oh, what am I seeing? I'm seeing average spot cost 4.8 million and some sponsors yeah. pay more than six. Yeah, so I'm seeing six and a half per 30 second oh. commercial. Yeah. So it's even more, which is which is nuts. But yeah, I always enjoy that. You know, it's a cool time. I We used to spend in college, my aunt and uncle would throw these awesome Super Bowl parties at our house. You know, a lot of the times the Patriots are playing in it, but yeah. we used to have all my girlfriends come over to their house. It was just just a good time. I just miss those days, kind of kind of reminiscing. But um, how about, Mike, we get to our picks? What do you say? Well, I, I think... We talked about this on TV. I think the only thing that would surprise me in this game is that if Cincinnati won it big, because I could see the other scenarios happening. I could see the Rams winning by a fairly wide margin, and then I could see a close game that goes either way. But to pin me down to a prediction, I think it comes down to the Bengals' ability to protect Joe Burrow, and I think there'll be times where they're just unable to do that against the pressure that the Rams can bring. And I think Stafford will be able to stay on his feet a little more consistently and and use some of his weapons. So um, I'm going to go Rams in this game. I was not a believer early in the, in the playoffs for the Rams, but they've, uh, they've converted me and I'm going to go Rams 27 Bengals 20, the over under in case you pay attention to that type of thing is 48 and a half. So you can add 27 and 20 and uh, but I've got, these games sometimes are not as high scoring as you assume they're going to be. So yeah. that's what I'll, that's what I'll go with uh, Rams by seven, 27, 20. You know, it's, it's funny. We're talking some of the Corby and Bob. I think Bob didn't believe it was going to be a close game. Corby, I think thought it would be close. It's funny because yeah. it's half enough. Some people think not going to be close. Other, I think it is going to be close, but Mike, I am a believer in the Cincinnati Bengals. So many people I mean, every week it seemed like they made history. They hadn't won a playoff game in such a long time, making their first Super Bowl appearance in, what, 33 or 34 years. Um, This will be the toughest task for Joe Burrow in terms of that defensive line. There's no question question, the pressure that he's going to get from guys like Aaron Donald, Von Miller, those guys. But I do think he will be able to get the ball out quickly. I think he's proven himself. I think he's 
you know, we're lucky as super uh, as football fans that we're going to get to watch Joe Burrow in his career because I think he's going to have a long career in the league, um, like some of these other young stud quarterbacks. But I don't know that there's just something about the offense. I just think, I just think their backs have been up against the wall where, where no one thinks that they're going to win, and they have, like you said, this swag, this confidence. This whole team does because people, if you look on paper, the Rams should win it. I mean, they're hosting it. Yep. You know, Matthew Stafford has all of the weapons around him, to your point there. Um, Cooper Cup is unbelievable. OBJ, he'll finally have his chance to shine on the stage. But I don't know. There's something about this Bengals team. I, I think they'll find a way to just cap off what's been a really historical season for the, for him coming off a, a season where he saw it was cut short because of his injuries. So I'm going Cincinnati 30 to 27. All right. Uh, Mrs. Stafford will be disappointed. Your your new friend, you picked <laughs> against her son in this game, but you know, we all, Sorry, we all make our choices. Margaret. Uh, we need you, since I always sign on for us, you're going to sign us off every time. That's going to be our new thing. I, I don't know exactly know what our sign up will be, but you're a creative guy. Eventually you'll find your line that you want to, yeah. you know, sign off with, but, uh, that's edition three in the books, Mike, and I'll let you take it away. Uh, well, join us every night at uh, 1030 on, on Fox 4 for free for all. And then what we can't fit on television, which is a lot, we'll talk about right here in, in this space, which the kids tell me is, is all the rage now, the, <laughs> the podcast or the pod, as some people call them. It's free for all after party. Thanks for being with us. Until next time. Party on, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Excellent, Mike. That was a great one. All right.